conference started. <laughs> Today is going to be a, a mixture between Bulgarian and English on my side, but as we have uh, more or less predominantly international guests, I think that um, I will be mostly using English. Um, with me today, um, because it, it was a messy organization, we have to admit, but I'll count a lot on the help of Asia Dobrujeleva from Habitat for Humanity. She'll be our co-moderator today. And I'm Gennady Kundarev from Zazemiata Friends of the Earth, Bulgaria. Um, I start with first a few uh, notes of precaution. Um, you're already aware why this conference was scaled down due to the epidemiological situation at the moment. So please, every one of you should have received uh, a piece of paper with instructions. Um, I really ask everyone to follow this protocol. I know that this room is full of altruistic, brave people who um, usually say, well, I'm not afraid of anything, I don't care of myself. Uh, it's not about ourselves uh, in many of the cases, it's about others. Uh, and uh, uh, coronavirus seems to be really a mean disease. Uh, it's spreading and it's a responsibility towards the rest of the world to try to hold it down as much as we can. Um, now I give the word to Asia. Thank you very much. I'll be speaking Bulgarian, so please put on your headphones if you want to understand me. My English is not good enough, so I think it would be better if I spoke English. Bulgarian, sorry. It is a great pleasure for me to help Gennady today with this event. Indeed, today, now that we are all truly connected, not just virtually connected, but really connected, and the coronavirus is another proof of that, whatever any of us does, does impact everybody else on the planet. I would like to draw your attention to the fact that what we do is actually very much connected to the 2030 uh, agenda, at, at least three of the goals that are formulated. The first is eliminating poverty, the second is accessible and clean energy, and the third, their first, seventh, and eleventh actually, is the sustainable, sustainable development of cities and communities. All of you know how important it is to all countries in the world to try to achieve these goals. They were set in 2015. Unfortunately, we haven't progressed much on them for five years later, globally speaking. Each and every one of us is responsible I would like to remind you of 87, many of you were not born back then, when the report on our common future was drafted. I'm guessing most of you have heard of, about it, which developed the idea of sustainable development. And back then, the environment did become one of the three pillars of development together with social and economic. So the focus on environment preservation has a long history and it has proven what, again and again how important it is to preserve what we have for future generation and not just us consuming all the resources. So the topic of air quality and the impact of heating on air quality is very important and it is a great pleasure for me to give the floor to Mrs. Rene Bruel, who will uh, greet us. She is the director of the um, building program, and she will present heating text of the European heating transition. The floor is yours. May please, the floor is yours. Uh, that's fine. Yes. Um, okay. 
Thank you very much, and thank you very much, uh, Gennady Atsia, for the uh, invitation to speak here about uh, European um, heating policies. And, uh, well, as already was said by Atsia, it's a super important uh, topic. And as you can see here, 36% of uh, greenhouse gas emissions from uh, uh, at EU level are from buildings, of which 80% is uh, related to heating both space heating and water heating, but the far the majority, 64%, 67% is uh, for space heating. So I would say it's not possible to reach climate neutrality without uh, reducing uh, emissions from heating. Um, yeah. So, and then I would say there are basically three pillars uh, at EU level to decarbonize heating. First is a main driver that's uh, climate neutrality, that it would be a main driver for decarbonizing heating. Then you would need to reduce the demand for heating to then allow to decarbonize the remaining heat demands. So a bit about the um, uh, demand for uh, residential heating. As I said, it's 80% uh, of uh, energy use of buildings is related to heating. And if you're looking at existing buildings in the EU, well, you can't fully see it on the slide, but um, about 75% of buildings in the EU are energy label D or worse. So that means they're highly inefficient. And only, it's hidden here, but only 3% of all buildings in the EU are A label. So that means there's a really, we need to really, um, Reno renovate uh, the whole building stock in Europe to a certain level that allows for decarbonized heating. And at the same time, you can't renovate all buildings to label A or to nearly zero energy um, because it's physically not possible or the cost will really um, be much higher than the savings. This, well, I will not explain this one, but this is showing at some point, uh, this is a slide for the Netherlands, the, at some point, it, between label B, uh, label B more or less, the cost outpaced the savings if you're looking at uh, renovation measures. So there you then need to um, go look at heating. And if you're then looking back to what has happened between 2005, 2016, the, um, you could say that the, this is an overview of um, emissions from the building sector between 2005 and 2016 for a few countries, the Netherlands, UK, Italy, Denmark, uh, Germany, and Sweden. And if you're looking, um, let's see. Well, if you're looking at this, the bottom line, that is Denmark, that managed to reduce its emissions from buildings by 55% in 10 years. Sweden managed to do that by 38%, while the other countries in Western Europe only reduced uh, emissions from buildings by 15% in those years. So what were the success factors for Denmark and Sweden on that? Well, the very first one that they had strict standards for uh, building envelopes and increasingly strict standards for building envelope. That was the, mo the, first, uh, the first reason. And then they had comprehensive local heat And there's also an expansion, been an expansion of district heating in uh, in Denmark and in uh, in Sweden, and high taxation on energy and CO2, and increasing with exemptions for renewable energy and last restrictions on the use of fossil fuel heating appliances in Denmark and Sweden. So you can reduce heating emissions by 55%, as is shown by many Denmark. And you see that already some member states across Europe are uh, experimenting or pioneering with a phase out of fossil fuels for heating. It's, um, this is just a snapshot, and I'm not sure if you can read it, but it basically gives the, the countries in green have policies on heating. 
Apart from all this, many countries also have policies on uh, building renovation, but this is really only looking at heating. And what you see is that most of the countries here, they, uh, they focus on uh, new builds, which is also the easiest. No longer connecting new builds to the gas grid, or no longer allowing new buildings to be uh, heated. Build needs to be nearly zero energy. Highly efficient. Um, so these are first steps to get new builds of schools, and from there you can go to existing buildings. But if you look at this overview, only Denmark and the Netherlands have really fully committed to um, uh, to decarbonize the whole heating, um, the residential heating by no longer allowing fossil fuels to the grid by 2050. And in the afternoon, I will present a bit about the Netherlands. So and then if you're looking at uh, your current European policies related to heating, um, there is the, um, there's the European heating and cooling strategy, which is a communication, so no legislation. Then there are four European directives that are important here. The first one you can't see, but it is a renewable energy directive. And that requires uh, member states to increase the renewable uh, heating and cool uh, share of renewable heating and cooling in total heating by 1.3% a year, uh, if I'm correct. So that's, uh, that's really um, a mandatory. And it also requires member states to endeavor to achieve 1% increase of renewable energy for district heating per year. So that's, that's quite, uh, that's something at least, and it's already been in place since 2014, if I'm correct. So you should have a uh, year-on-year increase of renewable uh, in heating. Then the Energy Efficiency Directive set a definition for efficient heating and cooling. That is 50% uh, of uh, heating, uh, heating and cooling needs to be uh, renewables or waste heat or cogeneration or a mix. And it requires member states to do a comprehensive assessment of the potential for highly efficient heating and cooling uh, at national level. The first assessment was due, was uh, uh, had to be submitted in 2014, and the next one is due end of 2020. So that's another one. And then there's the Energy Performance of Buildings or Directive that requires member states today to submit today a long-term renovation strategies that would lead to um, highly efficient and decarbonized building stock by 2050. And all new buildings need to be nearly zero energy by 2021. And the last one is the, the governance regulation, which uh, requires the national energy and climate plans. Well, it needs to have heating and cooling trajectories and measures related to the uh, renewable energy target of increase of renewable energy for heating and cooling. And the long-term strategies should in, uh, also include emissions from heating and from buildings. So then coming to yeah, the opportunities. Well, I'm sure you get the slides afterwards uh, so that you can read them. So the, ho the, the Green Deal, there is in the whole Green Deal, the word heating isn't mentioned at all, which was quite surprising to me. But um, looking at it again, uh, I, got, I, I became less pessimistic because there are some um, good opportunities in there. First is the climate law and, um, and by 2050. So that is, um, that would, could be a main driver for decarbonizing heating. Then there will be a revision of the energy efficiency directive and it will include article five and article 14. And uh, article five efficiency directive requires member states to renovate annually 3% of their central government buildings um, to higher efficiency and expand that article to all public buildings. So 3% of all public buildings uh, need to be renovated a year is what we're hoping for. 
The second one, it, it also Article 14, uh, will be revised, and that is a requirement on member states to uh, do an assessment of a highly efficient heating and cooling potential in their country. And that is something that could make sense to that with the requirement to develop long-term renovation strategies for the building stock. Then you could have a more integrated planning of buildings and heating and cooling supply. Something to strive for. Then a very important one is uh, eco-design. That is minimum efficiency requirements for, um, for appliances. And this year they will start a revision of the regulation for heating boilers. And that is really, that is a major opportunity because it isn't, it's not a directive, it's a regulation, so immediately effective in a member state. And uh, we uh, have in this regulation several steps that ultimately will lead to phasing out of fossil fuel heating boilers um, so that they ca new ones cannot be installed at a certain date in time. Then there is a proposal on smart sector integration, which was first under the previous commission, it was called the gas package, then it was called the decarbonization package, and now it's called the smart sector integration. We still don't know what is going to be in there, maybe you know, but um, it's probably very relevant. Then September we'll see our strategic communication on the renovation wave, which um, was announced in the Green Deal and it could be uh, a big impetus for uh, an increase of building renovation support in member states. The directive will be revised as well, at least to increase the target but hopefully also to uh, increase the targets for heating and cooling. The financing mechanisms, the energy, the European investment uh, energy lending policy, the new MFF, including just transition mechanism, invest EU, et cetera, et cetera. I'll leave it at that and uh, thank you very much. Uh, for the European perspective and quite a detailed one. Аз се благодаря ти за глобалното за глобалната картинка, която също Thank you Asia also for your uh, global uh, picture you presented. A few words from me on why we started, why we launched this initiative to promote the idea of domestic heating programs together with Asia from Habitat since 2012 when we took part in the working group on the new uh, region growing regions uh, program of the EU and we began with the idea that there should What product they should use? But the Sophie mentioned which now grow to a multi million uh, environment operator. We can uh, speak a lot about domestic heating. There's much to say. Uh, there are not a lot of us here today. I hope most people who registered are watching our streaming channels online. 
but we had more than 120 participants registered up until last week when we found out that we wouldn't be able to use the space which was planned initially. Uh, unfortunately, the window of opportunity ended. The last census in Bulgaria in 2012 made clear that 58% of households use uh, wood or coal for domestic heating, mostly wood, maybe a quarter or a third of it is coal. How much that has changed now, we cannot be sure. The remaining 40% back in 2012 used electricity, also in quite inefficient forms. The progress since then has been that some households have switched to mo modern biomass. Some have switched to uh, um, thermo pumps or um, air conditioners. We need to wait another year before the next census uh, gives us data on what has changed. There are also some surveys which um, our colleague from the Bulgarian Academy of Sciences will present later. Uh, we'll continue our program with guests from abroad. I just want to say before that that Everyone who is uh, watching us online can ask their questions or um, comments in the channel below the streaming window. The streaming can be found, well, if you're watching us, you probably know how to find it, but the links for the streaming are on the Zazimiata Facebook page and those links will remain for the recording. So if you're not able to watch us today, you can see the recordings in Bulgarian and English later during the next few months, hopefully until the next conference, because we are trying to make this type of event a regular regional tradition, which happens annually. Thank you once again. Thank all of you who who are here and everyone who's watching us online. I give the floor now to Hannah von Rumrader. Uh, she is from the Deutsche Umwelthilfe, an organization. Uh, our team on air quality has been working in close cooperation with in recent years. And together with colleagues from Germany, now you will learn a little bit more about what we're working on, targeting the most primitive forms of domestic heating where there are a lot of opportunities and a lot of room for improvement and progress as regards emissions and ways of use. There's huge potential. We'll learn more from H Hannah. Uh, I don't know what you just uh, talked about me. <laughs> Um, so, yeah, I'm uh, Hannah and I'm from the um, um, German Environmental Action or Deutsche Umwelthilfe, you might uh, better know it. Um, and I'm looking at the topic mainly from the air quality uh, view. We are working for uh, several years on the topic of emissions of the domestic heating in our department. And uh, yeah, and uh, at, in my first presentation now, I will uh, mainly speak about. Uh, this is about us. <laughs> I just sorry, and uh, <clears throat> uh, it's a bit. Can you put the uh, the okay. video on the other side or not? Okay. Yeah. The previous. The previous. Okay. Um, so you have about five ten minutes. Okay, um, yeah, in my first presentation I will more uh, speak about uh, the, the national regulations and programs in Germany, um, what we have in place for small uh, combustion in installations and uh, what we at, uh, as an NGO think about it. Um, the first, uh, well, yeah, in Germany there's a national regulation which is called Ordinance on Small Combustion Installations. 
and um, this is mainly a step by step phase out uh, of old appliances. Um, they have to be um, retrofitted or exchanged. Um, and uh, what we also think is really good is that there are uh, requirements on allowed fuels like uh, quality and humidity of wood, for example, it's all in there. And uh, the um, chimney sweeps in Germany have quite uh, yeah, a lot of competences. Uh, they come, I think, uh, two times in seven years at least uh, to uh, sweep the stoves and um, also um, check the uh, fuel storage and give instructions for uh, the user behavior or the, the yeah, how to operate the stoves. And uh, in case of boilers, there are also regular measurements on site at the moment, uh, which is also quite good. Um, yeah, what we criticize or what we think it should be, it should uh, be more is that there are really many exemptions for the phase out. Uh, for example, if you have an open fireplace, uh, you're still allowed to use it. Um, they say usually that uh, no one is really heating all his home with the open fireplace, uh, so they just took it completely out. <laughs> and um, yeah, and you are, um, also there's an exemption if it's o the only heat source in uh, Germany. Most of the um, uh, wood burning or um, uh, stoves are only for uh, a secondary heating, officially. But of course, you don't know how, my, how much the people really use it. That's uh, very different. Um, yeah, and uh, historic stoves are also um, outside of the regulation. Historic means older than 1950. And um, yeah, and of course, uh, from our point of view, you can't generally say all for, f uh, I mean, it's uh, true for all these change out programs that new stoves are generally generally cleaner. You can't really say that. Um, the, the dust limits that are set in the regulation are so, um, they are dust limits, but they are so weak that they are, um, can be reached without exhaust gas cleaning. And um, that really is in a way a problem because if you want to get below a certain um, emission, you have to have a filter or uh, electronic uh, participator. Yeah. Um. Where do we have to? Does it work? Yeah. No. Can I check it out? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I uh, just proceed. The next uh, slide is about uh, local restrictions for um, cleaner appliances because it's uh, it is possible for cities they want if they want to do more. Um, for example, in um, Stuttgart, there's a kind of temporary ban. Uh, Stuttgart is the city in Germany which has the biggest problems with, with fine dust. Um, but um, I think last year, all um, official measurement stations were uh, keeping the limit values, but yeah, just. And I mean, it's the, the limit values of the air quality directive and the WHO, for example, has uh, much lower limit values for uh, air quality. So, um, and we still think that there's uh, enough to do in that <laughs> part. Um, also, there are some uh, other permanent uh, restrictions in um, smaller cities like Aachen or Aschaffenburg, for example, they say um, there are no um, lockwood stoves in residential uh, areas allowed or um, they have um, this, uh, the, they have a quicker phase out than in the regulation and so on. <laughs> Wait. Yes. Ah, great. And uh, yeah, and the last um, that yeah, that's fine. Great. Um, and the last one is um, Berlin. They um, 
there is a regulation that uh, particle emission of heating systems have to be uh, the same as uh, oil and gas heating, um, but uh, which um, actually uh, keeps out all, uh, all wood appliances, um, but this only applies to new construction development plans and is very patchy. If you look throughout the city, you have uh, parts where you are allowed to, to uh, have new uh, appliances and others not, um, but they want to um, yeah, um, have a more um, holistic approach in this future. And uh, for example, they want to make the uh, new Blue Angel label for um, firewood stoves mandatory for new appliances. Um, later in my second presentation, I will speak a bit more about the new Blue Angel label for firewood stoves. Just, uh, yeah. Um, then I want to speak about the German situation with eco design for stoves and boilers. Try if it's, yeah, it's working. Um, there is a part uh, on the solid of the. If you look at the solid fuel boilers here, um, there is a deviation uh, from the from the eco design requirements in Germany. Um, the limit values are a bit lower for ones, and uh, there is what I said. Uh, these reoccurring measurements on site um, are there, and uh, the German government requested um, that they are allowed to keep this um, their own regulations, but uh, the, the EU didn't decide on it yet. It's all so. It's a bit at the moment. It's a situation you don't know really what regulation is <laughs> there, but I hope that will be um, cleared soon. Um, yeah. Um, what we think is uh, are flaws of the upcoming standards of eco designs, maybe uh, mainly if you focus on stoves, is um, that there are uh, many different uh, um, possibilities to to measure the particles, um, especially um, and the uh, type testing, um, and this really makes it difficult to compare different uh, particle emissions and so on. And, uh, and the, the method which is uh, mainly used is very, very not realistic. Uh, you are not able to uh, have so low emissions on your stove in, uh, at your home. It's not possible. Um, particle, it's uh, with stoves and uh, boilers only uh, particle mass is um, measured and not part particle number, but particle number is uh, for health um, aspects, it's the more interesting thing um, because, of course, if you have a very low mass uh, on particles, you still have very, uh, yeah, a, a higher number because it's yeah smaller of smaller parts. Um, yeah, as I said, the the test settings are not realistic, uh, and the emissions limits um, could be better. Definitely, it's the same uh, as the in the German regulation. Um, and uh, yeah, of course, there's the, still the open question: what happens uh, with the old appliances that is uh, that are there? Um, yes, um, just a, a short jump to a market incentive program, which is in place in Germany, and what uh, is it saying about um, um, biomass uh, burning? Um, there's a program, it's c uh, quite new, it's, or, or it was adapted, I mean it's in place for quite a long time, but they um, changed it a little and adapted it, um, and it's, uh, the new program is uh, there uh, since January. And um, it is that, uh, it says that you get 35% uh, of funding um, for in new and old buildings, and um, for solar heat, heat pumps, um, and but also pellet wood chip and firewood um, boilers, and uh, this is a bit n more new uh, for pellet stoves, with which are connected to the uh, warm water system. They are also included, and um, there are efficiency and uh, um, emission limit values for for the boilers who are funded, but um, uh, it is not. 
the, again, um, the, the exhaust cleaning technology is not mandatory. It is possible to get funding for it as well, but uh, it is not um, mandatory. Yeah, uh, that's it for the first. The rest I will tell in the afternoon, I think. <laughs> Thank you, Hannah. The next presentation was supposed to be by the colleagues from Tuzla, but I think we have a minor technical challenge, so we'll do a quick substitution. Alex, are you ready to start? We just need to uh, exchange. Just a moment, maybe the colleagues from Tuzla will be able to do their presentation. Thanks for being <sighs> Can we also have sound? Okay, we just need a couple of more minutes technical break. I'll just allow myself to say a few words about the next presentation. It's very interesting because the colleagues from Tuzla actually launched a very ambitious project about uh, substituting inefficient heating systems uh, in homes by uh, uh, thermal pumps. It's funded by the local municipality, aiming to offset uh, harm, uh, pollution. Uh, and it's a very interesting project because it allows us to draw a very interesting economic parallel uh, between the installation of different domestic heating systems because in the Balkans, we've mostly been um, replacing old uh, stoves with uh, gas boilers or uh, pellet stoves, uh, new and more progressive systems working with electricity, highly efficient, such as thermo pumps, are still rare. And the parallel we can draw in the next year when the economic results uh, come in uh, is very interesting. Are we ready? We have sound. Amel, can you, can you say a few words? Can we, I think we do. Do can ask Vlad to try again? Uh, do you hear me? One, Super, one. yes. Yes. Just a, okay. Amel, they need just a minute so they can export the sound through the... Uh, we're done, we're done, Ivo. We, we already yeah, have the sound. Can start. Yes, so... I can I can start my you can start right? please okay thank you <clears throat> uh, ladies and gentlemen uh, do you hear me right yes okay perfectly okay okay thank you uh, ladies and gentlemen uh, my name is Amel Husic uh, and it's my pleasure to participate in a conference like this uh, I work in Central Hungaria in Tuzla, uh, in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, today I'm going to talk about expanding potentials of district heating network and uh, alternative solutions. Uh, so, uh, uh, district heating network uh, from uh, co-generation uh, has been in use uh, uh, for 37 years. Uh, the system uses a uh, 145-75 temperature regime, uh, originating a few kilometers away from the city at the thermal power plant. Uh, the system uh, has been uh, concipiated uh, that, that every building uh, has its own uh, substation uh, with heat exchanger and uh, flow regulator. Uh, in the area uh, near the plant, uh, every building has additional pressure regulator. Uh, the documents uh, from uh, 81 uh, allows connections to multifamily uh, residential objects with four or more flats only 
but uh, not for individual uh, residential houses. Uh, our district heating zones are limited uh, to elevation of uh, 265 above sea level. On this slide, uh, we can see uh, chronological important documents and uh, constructions. Uh, first, we made a conceptual design 69. Then we, uh, 81, uh, create a main project. Uh, so we can build our main pipeline uh, 82. Uh, after that, 2001 was the year when we have our district heating zones expanded uh, up to 39. And uh, after that, uh, 2010 and uh, 11, uh, we ha had our district heating zones expanded uh, once more uh, with 16 uh, zones, new zones. So now we have uh, 55 uh, district heating zones. Uh, 2017 uh, was the year when we uh, decided to finance uh, connections to private, private houses. And uh, 2018, uh, we had uh, decided uh, for co-financing heat pumps for uh, private houses. Uh, last year, we had additional plans for district heating expansion. On uh, this slide, uh, this graph actually uh, show us uh, capacity growth between uh, 2001 and 2018, where we can see uh, that in the uh, past two decades, we have expanded from uh, 150 megawatts up to 240 megawatts. Uh, up to uh, 2015, uh, we were oriented in large areas with multifamily buildings. And after uh, 2015, we were oriented more in areas with uh, individual houses. Uh, for areas uh, with uh, individual houses, we provide heating system uh, with large uh, central uh, heat substation uh, with uh, installed power of uh, two or three megawatts and with the student work uh, this slide we can uh, see a uh, first area with this system uh, it was built in 2014 also uh, another three systems like this we have in construction phase those are batva uh, maidan and square uh, Maidan has a uh, uh, 1.5 uh, megawatt and it's in construction phase. Uh, so our district heating system uh, in uh, last uh, five years uh, get uh, those changes. We have a cooler, then we have uh, three uh, large substation uh, near the thermal power plant installed. Uh, we have in construction phase Kratska, uh, Batva, and Medan, but we ha had also uh, created projects for the future uh, area center and the area Dragodo. So in ne next few years, our system will uh, look like this. Uh, in next few slides, I will uh, analyze uh, one system like this uh, from various aspects. Uh, this system uh, we designed like this uh, because we have reduced uh, hydraulic impact on whole district heating system. On this slide, we can see a uh, district heating uh, network, secondary side, and also connections. Uh, very important uh, is that those connections is financed by the city and uh, individual substation is financed by the resident. Uh, this is a, a look uh, of one a central heat substation from outside and inside. 
And like I said, uh, we, with this concept, we have reduced uh, hydraulic impact on whole district heating system, and especially on east side of the city, which is further away from Rama power plant. Also, uh, with this system, we have a simple and efficient management. Uh, with this uh, system, we provide a heat power for about 200 households. But until today, uh, 105 has been connected. Uh, this central substation, uh, which is very important, uh, requires additional uh, 32 uh, cubic meter per hour from our uh, producer of uh, heat energy and from distribution network. Uh, before uh, construction uh, we, uh, of the project, we simulate uh, distribution in Thermis. Uh, who doesn't know, uh, Thermis is a hydraulic modeling tool that uh, simulates flow, pressure and temperature behavior in this heating distribution network. Uh, unlike other tools, uh, Thermis uh, uses uh, real-time data to analyze the system and monitor its current state. Uh, this allows operators to make better and smarter decisions to optimize heat distribution. Uh, so, uh, before this project, uh, pressure difference uh, between uh, supply line and return line was like this. We have uh, labeled, labeled it uh, with the blue color. So we uh, can see that uh, all our customers get uh, heat, required heat energy. Uh, but uh, when we uh, made a simulation with uh, uh, installation of uh, one of these uh, large uh, heat substation, uh, we get uh, this state. We can see uh, the negative, uh, the pressure difference between uh, supply line and return line. It means uh, the return line pressure is larger uh, uh, than a supply line. It's not good. Uh, it means all our customers don't get enough uh, heat energy. So uh, then we consider uh, main line reconstruction, part of main line reconstruction, and uh, this. Uh, uh, and after we uh, reconstructed uh, main line. Uh, we get a positive pressure difference. When we simulate with this reconstruction, we get we'll uh, get uh, uh, this this tape. Uh, in financial aspect, uh, we invest uh, through a few phases about uh, almost eight hundred thousand of euros. It means uh, about uh, 2,400 uh, euros per household. Uh, it's a large amount of money, but it's only for 53% uh, connected objects. Uh, exact and environmental impact of each project uh, can be evaluated only with measurements before and after construction. Uh, we didn't have uh, measurements, uh, but with the number of households uh, and their uh, heat supply uh, demands, we evaluate coal consumption uh, with this simple formula. formula. Uh, during the uh, incomplete combustion, uh, we also produced carbon monoxide, methane and other uh, polluted gases. Uh, we evaluate, uh, evaluated that this project reduced the total emissions by uh, 1,000 uh, to uh, 2,000 tons of CO2 in five years. Uh, to understand the uh, gains of uh, uh, this project, uh, we, uh, we will take a look uh, in a study of air pollution in Tuzla region from 2016. Uh, we can see uh, that we reduced CO2 uh, emission for about half percent in housing sector. Uh, in uh, 2016 and 2017, um, we made a map of uh, coal tools uh, for new district heating expansion. 
and uh, with this concept uh, we made a register for several municipalities uh, with collected the data uh, we uh, collected a uh, square footage uh, number of residents a uh, method of heating coal pellet wood gas etc etc and also the insulation on objects uh, those maps looks like this uh, those are not uh, houses uh, with the political party members memberships uh, those are maps with a method of uh, heating uh, greens mean uh, eco or eco friendly source of heating and orange means uh, coal and wood and for example uh, for uh, municipality she cello we estimate that we have uh, <clears throat> more than uh, 850 uh, objects with more than uh, 54 percent who has coal and wood stools and we calculated that we uh, for this area we need capacity of uh, 21 uh, megawatt uh, guided by this data uh, we decide in 2090 to co-finance installation of uh, heat pumps and external insulation of objects with 50% uh, of investment up to 2,500 euros. Uh, so, uh, without exact uh, data, uh, we uh, couldn't uh, calculate uh, exact uh, uh, heat consumption uh, and the very difficult to estimate consumption of electric energy for heat pumps. Uh, but with uh, 67 objects uh, that are uh, connected in uh, this heating uh, Tuzla, uh, we assumed that, that they were heated by heat pumps. Uh, for this object, we uh, have measured uh, exact heat, heat consumption and we took monthly average uh, temperature and adopt uh, COP fact factor for 2.9. With that, uh, actually pessimistic data we get imaginary electric for example for january uh, in the coldest month uh, 2018 consumption for these households uh, we uh, get that 67 uh, analyzed objects during january which is coldest month in the year uh, with average cop factor would pay uh, near about uh, uh, 0 0.7 euro per square meter or uh, 30 euro per megawatt hour uh, it's a very small amount uh, in the streets uh, where we collected uh, data on households we also uh, made a survey uh, collecting data on uh, household income and the uh, method of heating uh, we get uh, this uh, chart where we can see that this source of heating uh, where is directly related to household monthly income. So we can see that our uh, poorest citizens uh, uh, are mostly uh, heated by coal and our wealthier uh, citizens are heated by uh, heat pumps, electric power and district heating network. Uh, because of protection of uh, personal data law, uh, we couldn't make a social map of uh, particular parts of the city but if we remember our previous map uh, we can uh, we can conclude this previous map we can conclude that if we eradicate uh, poverty we will eradicate uh, energy poverty uh, beside this uh, simple conclusion uh, we also uh, can conclude that uh, before construction of a district heating system uh, for individual households we must consider all aspects Be before a fall we must consider economic aspects well uh, how money does it cost also the technical aspect uh, where we uh, must know uh, heat consumption energy efficiency of houses and make uh, all uh, simulations also we must consider environmental impact that we, we will make 
also uh, urban planning uh, because these systems are um, created uh, for uh, individual houses, not large scale buildings, and also the social aspect. Uh, this trick heating system uh, has no competition when it comes to com for comfort, maintenance and service costs. Uh, in this presentation, uh, we didn't analyze other pollutants, uh, industry, traffic, etc., etc. Uh, also, a very important uh, conclusion is uh, that uh, district heating system can be a uh, part of the solution for air pollution by individual houses, but not the only one. Uh, affordability, of, unfortunately, is a limit for uh, abolition of coal use in uh, individual houses. In our country, uh, energy class of object uh, actually plays a crucial ro role in financial expense on a monthly basis. Regardless of fuel, uh, uh, in Tuzla there is a lot, huge potential uh, for savings in individual houses, but also in collective buildings. Uh, illegal uh, buildings are uh, also a big uh, legal obstacle in financing and co-financing uh, all air pollution reductions. Uh, our uh, plan for the future will be uh, to create a detailed uh, register of Tuzla with heating source components and with strict, strict zones for uh, different way, ways of heating. Uh, we, we will have uh, zones with heating, with district heating, and zone uh, for heating with other sources like uh, heat pumps, pellet, etc., etc. Uh, my presentation, I will finish uh, with this uh, quote of uh, unknown author who says, uh, we didn't inherit an environment from our grandparents, but we uh, borrowed it from our grandchildren. Uh, that would be all uh, and if anyone has a comment or, or, or a question, it will be my pleasure uh, for answer it. Thank you, Amal. Um, can you please stay for a few more short seconds? Може ли само да останеш с нас за още няколко секунди, защото имаме някои въпроси към теб? И, И освен... I can imagine, which is the reason why I would ask you to shortly mute yourself so that there would be no interference and um, you would receive now from... Do, do you hear us well now? Yes, yes, now it's okay. okay. So, um, I'll be going around the room if there would be any questions. There are already two things that, uh, that came uh, regarding your presentation. Actually, one from me and one from Asia. <laughs> Um, uh, we are curious to know what is the type of thermal of, uh, of heat pumps that were installed. Is it um, uh, a heat pump which required uh, um, drilling, uh, uh, drilling for geothermal? Or is it uh, an air-to-air -air heat pump? What was the type of the technical solution? Can, can, is it okay if we, if we first submit all the questions because then we need to mute and it's a little bit of a heavy procedure. Okay, okay. Then uh, the question specifically from us is how exactly do you deal with um, illegal buildings when you have to, uh, to install a new solution there? Yeah? And uh, raising hands, is, are there further questions from the room to, to the presentation of Amma? We have engineers, come on. <laughs> Anyone? Okay, well, um, these two questions, can you please uh, unmute and answer, and I'll be muting our microphone. Ah, uh, okay. Hold a second, hold a second, Amel. One more question from Petr Hlobil from Bankwatch. Um, I, did you consider as a part of the supply of the energy, 
your district heating is supplied uh, the heating in relatively high temperature. Uh, did you consider a part which would allowing the storage, seasonal storage of the heating? That's one thing. The second, uh, second issue, whether in some part of the heating system, whether you would go down with the temperature of the system to, let's say, 30 centigrade, basically have a fifth generation of the district heating system, and there use it for the collecting the heat from the, so, for example, the solar, solar heating installed on the housing, and as well on the option of using the heat pumps that would be taking the heat from the low temperature water in this low temperature system. These are all the questions, Amel. Can you only, only repeat me a second question, please? The, the second question was, how do you deal with when you have um, an illegal building and you would like to change there to work on the heating system there? Illegal being building. Il illegal. 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 Yes, illegal building. Like building that doesn't uh, have uh, construction permits oh, okay, and okay. that it's okay, okay. somewhere. Illegal. Okay, uh, can I now answer it? Yes, go ahead, please. Yes. Okay, uh, for the first question, uh, where you asked uh, uh, what type of uh, heat pumps we uh, co-finance, uh, we co-finance all heat pumps. Uh, we didn't exclude, exclude any heat pump, nor uh, heat to water, uh, water to water, and air to water. Uh, but uh, in the city, uh, our experience shows that uh, we actually uh, most of heat pumps are uh, air to water because we did uh, uh, we don't have space for a uh, combustion for a uh, large area and uh, we don't have uh, for, for uh, space for drilling uh, holes uh, and uh, for second question uh, you asked uh, how we deal with uh, illegal buildings uh, who wants to connect on our district heating system. Uh, well, uh, from the law, we, uh, we shouldn't connect it at all. But uh, from the environmental aspect, we have uh, we have decided to connect all uh, nor illegal or illegal building uh, to the district heating system. So uh, so we will. Uh, Reduce, reduced uh, pol uh, air pollution in, in, in Tuzla. Uh, and uh, for the third question, uh, our colleague asked about uh, season storage and uh, season storage of uh, he uh, heating, uh, heat energy, and uh, heat. Uh, he asked, uh, do we? Uh, uh, use uh, heat pumps uh, to pump uh, our uh, uh, low energy uh, return uh, to, to thermal power plant, if I get correctly. Uh, first question, uh, yes, we have considered uh, storage for, for uh, uh, heat energy, uh, but uh, we also uh, have a problem with space. Uh, for a uh, storage of uh, district heating network uh, size of Tuzla with uh, 240 megawatts, uh, we need a large, large, uh, a large space uh, storage. Uh, so, so one kind of this uh, was built in Zagreb. Uh, so uh, we considered it, but we didn't uh, build any. And. Uh, uh, when you uh, ask about uh, consuming uh, heat pumps for uh, using uh, return uh, heat energy with low temperature, uh, we uh, yes we have considered, but we uh, our main problem is uh, 
capacity of a causal system was built uh, in a like you see in my presentation uh, 82 year and uh, our uh, it's conceived of 145 75 temperature regime for this uh, regime uh, our district heating network is uh, built designed because uh, when we uh, also yes we we consider uh, make that temperature lower about 120 and 60 uh, we, we consider that but before that we have to uh, reconstruct our main line because it's uh, the uh, 60 uh, uh, 600 nominal pro, nominal diameter and uh, installed power we need uh, more water uh, in the few few last years uh, our flow was between uh, 2000 uh, square meters per hour up to 2000 and uh, maybe maybe 300 but uh, for this uh, size of the uh, city and uh, uh, installed power uh, with a uh, uh, designed regime uh, we should be have about 2700 2800 and we uh, for now we didn't get get that much uh, that would be all if you have any comment please please tell me. actually we have three more questions that arrived um, so first one comes from this is Lava Mikova from Greenpeace Bulgaria and it's the question where do the funding come from um, for co-financing for for the projects in the households uh, this co-financing of 2500 euro um, if you would note that down the second question comes from um, Mr. Vasil Zlatev uh, who asks um, how are the households being chosen? What are your criteria? And Felix is also going to pose a question from the room. Okay. We have a mic. Yeah. Um, hello, Mr. Husic. Um, thank you for this presentation. Um, I would like to know what is um, the city's vision for the supply side, knowing that the Tuzla power station uh, is quite old and uh, what do you yeah, intend to do um, on, on the supply side? Okay. <clears throat> uh, well, for the first question, uh, uh, where you ask uh, how, where do we uh, find uh, money for uh, co-finance uh, this it's actually a co-finance from the budget of uh, capital budget of the city and it's a plan every year uh, about uh, a half million uh, convertible marks and we expect because last year was the first it was only half million of the convertible marks but uh, in next years we hope that uh, this amount will be uh, uh, larger and for the second question, uh, uh, house, how, uh, how households have been chosen uh, for, for this co-finance? Well, it's uh, open, open a call for every house to uh, call and uh, one, one uh, is a must uh, to one, uh, uh, the household has, has to be uh, legal. Uh, so uh, the household uh, must have a, a low, a, a, a low, low prescribed uh, uh, papers, uh, and uh, also we uh, create a, a energy uh, certificate that says uh, energy level of the household. So the best best object with uh, best energy efficiency uh, uh, layer uh, or, or the level uh, gets gets uh, co-finance. For now, we have uh, all objects that are uh, co uh, call for 
us to co-finance, we uh, all uh, get the money. Uh, and uh, for third, third question, uh, what is city vision about thermal, thermal power plant and uh, capacity? Uh, well, uh, uh, our colleagues from uh, Electro Privreda, Bosnia and Herzegovina, are uh, start to uh, raise a new a new uh, thermal thermal power plant, uh, Block Seven. Uh, it should be uh, started uh, this year with with construction works, and it should be uh, fin finished. I I think uh, 2023. So uh, that would would be. Uh, strategic uh, option of uh, Tuzla for, for district heating network and also for producing uh, electrical power. Thank you, Mr. Husic. Um, I hope it was not too much of a technical challenge because I already got a few, a, a bit of feedback that there was um, unpleasant echo in the beginning of, of this uh, presentation. It's a bit clumsy, but this is the technical solutions that we provided um, for today. Um, we have to move now as the time is advancing with the other presentations and I'm inviting Alexander Matsura from Res Foundation from Belgrade. Um, Everyone online, please, please stay tuned. Thank you very much, Amel. Okay, okay. It's everything was okay. Yeah, I think so. Uh, there was a bit of echo, but uh, it was okay, I think. Okay. okay. Yeah, the English, the English version, because they were hearing your original voice, was a bit noisy. But uh, the Bulgarian version was okay because the translator was speaking actually. So, <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. so uh, do you want? That was good. Can I just? Um... Sorry. Sorry. Evo, we could hear you. Just please mute. Ta da! Okay. All is yours. Uh, thank you. Uh, we've heard how it's done in the West. Amel presented what's going on in Bosnia and Herzegovina. So we are moving now more East. Uh, we've been, I would say, in the 20th century with this presentation. Peter is going to take us to the 21st century. But this one is more about 19th century, I would say, that uh, presents where Serbia stands. So um, I start with the air quality issue. It's probably a picture that is seen everywhere in the countries that are present here. So to cut the long story short, this is from the official report of Serbian Environmental Protection Agency. So wherever PM10 was monitored in 2018, there was exceedance of annual average limiting values. So everywhere where there is a PM monitoring, we have uh, an issue with the air quality. This is for the PM10. It would be more or less the same with the PM2.5. Only we monitor PM2.5 in fewer locations, but there is a very high correlation. A huge part of PM10 in Serbia is PM2.5. So we have an issue with the air quality. Uh, our inventories, which are certainly imperfect, like everybody's inventories, but they still tell us something about the primary PM emissions, the sources of the primary PM10 and PM2.5 emissions, and you can see them here. Roughly 30 out of 55 uh, PM10 comes from household heating, and roughly 30 out of 40 PM2.5 comes from household heating. So heating is by far the main source of primary PM. I guess you all know that uh, in the end, in the concentrations of PM that we breed, there is also a share of secondary created PMs. We don't have sufficient amount of source apportionment studies in Serbia, so we are not able to tell exactly how big is the share of secondary PM in Serbia, but I would say that based on what we have, we can still say that in the peak pollution days, it's household heating. It's primary PM that very strongly predominates uh, the concentrations that you've seen in the first slide. So there is a very clear connection uh, between the heat and the air quality. Of course, uh, we, were talking, uh, we were talking about uh, the energy transition. So the issue of decarbonization uh, is also something that we have to uh, look when we consider sustainable heating options. Uh, what is bringing us here actually with these uh, 
uh, emissions and the quality of air that you saw is actually decarbonization. Unfortunately, vast majority of the PM comes from the biomass heating. So it's renewable source in a way. Having said that, we've already seen from the previous presentations that there are options for better heating even with biomass. Uh, the health data, you've heard all the health data for various and difficult different countries in the region and more or less it's similar. Uh, there was a recent WHO studies for 11 cities in Serbia which shows uh, the benefits to the health, the reduction of premature deaths that would have occurred if we reduce PM2.5. What is, I think, most interesting here is that even when you go down, you know, from 10 uh, uh, micrograms per meter cubic reduction to 20, you still have significant benefits in terms of reduction of premature deaths. So as also, as we heard from the previous presentations, there is actually no safe limit of PM2.5 emissions. According to the European Environmental Agency data, Serbia uh, out of 41 jurisdictions that is listed um, in, in the report on, on, of air quality in Europe, Serbia ranks second in terms of years of life lost per 100,000 inhabitants. So we, were, we beat Bulgaria in that sense. Uh, and this is a huge and, and a serious, serious issue. And as we saw, it has to do uh, with the heating. So what types of heating actually households in Serbia do use? It's pretty much similar to what we've heard uh, Gennady presenting uh, based on census data from 2011. Uh, Serbian Statistical Office in its household budgetary survey uh, is covering this topic on annual basis. I think these are data from 2017 maybe. Uh, there are more recent data from 2018 but changes are, are uh, very slow and uh, the results are more or less stable. So almost 60% of households in Serbia use solid heating, similar to what we've heard. Uh, was the case in Bulgaria in uh, year 2011. Uh, the statistics is not very precise, so we cannot tell exactly which, 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 what share of fuel wood is there and what share of coal is, uh, but vast majority of households do use wood predominantly for heating, and we can tell that from different secondary uh, sources of data. So this is the picture. The name of the presentation was, I think, a struggle for sustainable uh, heating policies in Serbia. Until recently there was no such struggle. So uh, this is the situation I would say that uh, almost entire heating is unsustainable. Uh, even the district heating comes from the sources which are um, in my opinion, not sustainable for different reasons. Serbia uh, is relying 100% of direct use of fossil fuels in its district heating system, which means it's buying commercial expensive fuels, creates hot water, not at the temperatures that we've heard from Amel. Luckily, those temperatures are a little bit lower in our district heating systems, but still, so it burns gas in vast majority of system, and creates hot water and then transport along thousands of kilometers of pipes. It doesn't make economic sense. Still, it's better for air than the other options, but please. It is 40%, it's in addition. So 40%, this is different, this is different data. Okay, these are the shares of heat, the modes of heat, regardless of whether household has central heating installation or not. But this is uh, an additional data that tells us that 60% of household do not have radiators. So it limits the options for fuel switch in those households. And maybe just as a side note, this is the highest share in the region by far. Other countries in the region have a lower share of household with central heating installations. These households are not seen by any public policy, in my opinion. Not in Serbia, not in, not in other countries. So these are the shares, and this is additional fact which we have to have in mind and which is probably counterintuitive to other people coming from uh, countries even more west than Bosnia is. Uh, what is the real life situation? The GIZ has done one uh, recently, it has performed a, a very detailed survey on a large sample of households, um, examining the situation in those households. I think the most striking, but not new, 
uh, finding is that the real life efficiency of devices used is 32.59. This is what I found uh, in their in situ tests. But this is completely not new. I would say that we have a million of historical stoves using the words from the, from the first presentation. In terms of technology, definitely. All those devices are technology-wise older than 1950s. They might be new, they might be brand new, but still this is the technology that is very, very old and, and obsolete. Uh, what came as a surprise to me, and what is, I think, a good news, is that uh, people were recognizing the issue. So they knew that there is something wrong with the device, and they were open for, for um, perhaps a policy that is going to, uh, to help them uh, replace the devices. These are some additional data. From the past, our statistical office discontinued this, the monitoring of the number of stoves uh, in the households. Now the only question is whether do you have any kind of stove, electric or, or, or solid, and the answer is literally 100%, so it doesn't really make sense. I hope that this question will be returned to the, to the statistical office questionnaires. Uh, those households in, in cold days are supplementing their heat with the electricity, causing system-wide peaks, which is also causing poor utilization of electric acid. What is, I think, another a good thing is that there is already public money being spent in support to the vulnerable energy customers. Unfortunately, this is uh, the, the air quality issue hasn't been taken into account at all, or the uh, or the real um, content of the energy poverty issue hasn't been taken into account so far. What has changed? Uh, for decades, this situation is like I've described. There was there is nothing new in the situation, but somehow, finally, the uh, the issue came to the focus of the, of the decision makers. Previous heating season, we've seen an increase in interest by by the media and by by the politicians, and this heating season, it finally exploded. So there was uh, in January, the government created an ad hoc uh, emergency group to deal with the issue. There was a, a working group established by the line ministry last, last year around the same topic. It did nothing, everybody forgot about it. And the government announced some ad hoc measures, but in no way those measures constitute policy. They are, you know, in, in some instances people could even think that uh, it's just making jokes with the population. But having said that, uh, I would also say that there is a great opportunity in Serbia the greatest ever, whether it's good enough that we will see, because there is an attention. We've been in position to discuss with numerous people, including with the government people on different occasions, including yesterday, and there is interest that I have never seen around the topic before. Where is it going to lead us? We will see. What are the challenges? The challenges are pretty much the same everywhere. I listed some of those here. What is literally needed is interaction with million, of ho million households. This is the invisible million. Nobody ever saw those households in public policies in the past. It's pretty much the case in the region as well. For example, National Energy Efficiency Plan doesn't mention the issue of million devices with which, which efficiency is 30%. This is literally un I mean, un unacceptable. What could be uh, an option, although it has been criticized for us, eco-design is a salvation. So if there would be a uh, rapid introduction of the new eco-design uh, requirements in, the, in Serbia, obviously it would have to be gradually introduced with the cooperation with the producers, huge production, domestic of the devices, but this definitely would be a huge, huge step ahead. When you look at the graphs and, and the smoke coming out from uh, eco-design, uh, compliant stove and the old stove, it's a huge, huge difference. It could be 20, 20 times lower. And then adding that people are using all kinds of things. Uh, I think the critical thing is design and implementation of a robust change out scheme because it has to be a very large scale one. It has to be appealing enough for the people to participate, but if it's too appealing, then the, it would be overwhelming. It wouldn't be possible to implement it if the subsidy is too good. So it's very difficult to have a proper targeting. It could be resolved, but this is something that we are talking now with the government people and they're thinking themselves about this thing as well. Which agency to lead? This is also a big, big issue because it cuts across all the sectors. It's also local and national. We talked with Dennis, uh, local governments have a lot of competencies according to the um, 
legal framework in the, in the air quality, but in reality, these are issues that surpass their capacities. This is not about moving slightly things. This is reshuffling the whole stuff, includes standard introdu introduction and all other stuff. So I, I, don't say, I don't think that the local level can lead in design of the scheme. It can certainly lead on implementation. The financing, you mentioned some option. Uh, maybe piloting, this is perhaps also an issue. Synergy with decarbonization. Now gas looks like a extremely good stuff. Uh, whether this is good enough, whether we lock ourselves into the uh, long-term carbonized heat, I think we do, so we have to look also for other solutions. Role of district heat, I've mentioned the, the issues that we have. Uh, synergies and trade-offs will building efficiency. This is a completely new topic. It will take us another conference just to discuss that, but what is going to come first, building or heating, depends also on the time horizon that we are looking at. Uh, role of natural gas is set, role of heat pumps, I, I'm happy that we've been able to see what was done in Tuzla, what people in Tuzla are doing, and we, we look forward to learn more about the issue. The next things just I would like to mention that we are going to do as a relatively small organization trying to help is national survey. This one we still don't have funding, but we are looking for it. A national survey on heating and energy poverty also taking into account the um, building typology. This is the best that we can have. Just to try to understand where are the trade-offs and synergies. The inventory of existing public schemes to see how much money is being spent in this direction and uh, what is the scale of possible improvements, and I would say it's huge. And the last thing, and I'm inviting you to join us on the 2nd December, this is tentative date 2020 in Serbia. Uh, we are aiming high currently, we will reduce our ambitions probably along the way, uh, to have a regional conference that would uh, definitely be a, a learning event for policymakers and everybody else who's keen on the topic. And we would like really to trigger robust policy making and implementation of this scheme. Serbia is going to have an election in April, so we will have a relatively new government by then, and we really think this is a great opportunity to try to influence their uh, four-year cycle uh, and hope to see you there, and we will be sharing our invitations as we go along. Thank you very much. And the main message. Well, thank you, Alexander. Um, we wanted to have you as a presenter already last year at the first conference. Uh, we will continue immediately uh, with the presentation of Petr Hlobil, but just a very tiny announcement. Yes, the, we'll try to pack the questions after all the presentations, if there is any time left. We don't know what's going to happen with the coffee break, though, because we are already in the time slot for coffee break. What I would suggest is we have a very flexible coffee break. Uh, not not crowding too much, just person by person, apply hand sanitizer, grab coffee, come over back in the room so that we can continue with the presentations and a bit of questions, if that is fine. I can also help you have some orderly manner to do that. Uh, can you put a presentation on? Presentation. Okay. Uh, I spent the last for, for quite a lot of time thinking about the district heating and how to develop a sustainable alternatives to the district heating. But Gennady asked me to do something different. So I just try to look on the example of the household. Well, I'm trying to get to your presentation though, but yeah. I'm not very successful yet. Uh, uh, which the example would be the, my own house. Uh, I think it's, 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 it's more easy to look into the thinking. Can you put it as a, like a full screen? Okay. And next one. Yeah. So the, uh, the house was built in the 30s by my wife's grandfather. And it went for the reconstruction in 2009. And the main reason for the reconstruction, there were two main reasons for the, for the motivations. One was a reduce, if my one, and that was a reducing the emissions and reducing the energy consumption of the house. Uh, there was also the second reason in the time there was a new program for the uh, energy efficiency introduced by the government, which 
uh, I was part of you know consultations on the developing the program and so I wanted actually to try how that works and so there was a subsidy program so there was a subsidy in it but actually the the main obstacle for that is that it was actually a big investment and so the the motivation of my wife was not the insulation of the house the motivation for my wife was that during the reconstruction we will have a new kitchen yeah <laughs> i'm not i'm not saying it's a joke yeah I think it's because I think it's, this is what we need to deal with the multiple households because if we want to reduce our carbon emissions to zero by the 2050, we need to persuade every single household in this country, in Europe and globally to actually change completely their houses, their flats, their apartments to make them more efficient and more depending on the non-fossil fuel sources of, of energy. And I think is the, the biggest barriers will be not technical. The biggest barriers will be the motivations, why people would do it. Are we going to force everyone, you know, be by regulations or are we going to find the right kind of motivation? So I'm not going the, I think is in the announcement is something about a cost benefit analysis. I'm actually trying to look into the motivations because I believe that's the more essential for us to communicate with the larger public. Yeah. Uh, just for the for the for sort of the bit of statistics, where we are in Prague in comparison to Bulgaria or the or the Balkans, as you see the the summers are not so hot and winters are not so severe. So it's quite moderate climate. And we have a decent sunshine between April and September. Then the other six months of the year do not provide enough solar radiation for something meaningful to do with it. Uh, the, just to, to say something about what, how the reconstruction was done. There is a four, 14 centimeters of, of insulation. There is a triple glazing uh, windows. It's a deep rehabilitation as it normally defined. So we have completely, uh, 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 we have insulated the, the ground as well. We have a completely insulation of the, of the roof. Uh, so it's a complete, complete insulation. If I uh, look to the, to the costs, then the, uh, we also installed a solar system. And so the total costs of the, of the, uh, of the system was something like a 27,000 euro. Out of it, roughly 10,000 was financed by the government subsidies. Anyway, look to the, to the payback that with the subsidies, the payback period is roughly 14 years. Uh, without subsidy, it would be 25 years. Uh, normally, people don't look in their households in the, in the payback. I think the real payback was satisfaction of my wife with a new kitchen. Uh, and I think it's an improving a quality of the house as such. Uh, but I think it's what is, what is another interesting thing because we frequently as my organization communicate with the bankers and they like to present the investment which is basically generated by their loans and they coming with a factor usually one to three. If you're looking here with the 10,000 subsidies from the government, the end investment was the 50,000. So the factor it's one to four. So actually we are doing much better than the European Investment Bank or other banks as they calculating this factor. Because the government primarily looking to the investment in the energy efficiency measure, but the reality was the all other investment in the improvement of the house are not calculated in their calculations. They were calculated in my pocket. So I think that's, that's quite interesting also for the communication with the decision makers because the investments and the subsidies, for example, for the energy efficiency could mobilize the capital investment from the public. But there's a different type of the communication than towards, towards the public. 
Now, if I look to the, to the heating, when we designed the system, there were two, uh, two things. One, the, in that time, there was no electricity from renewables possible to buy in the Czech Republic. You can just buy the centralized energy supply, which have a high content of coal and high content of nuclear. And thus the CO2 emission, if, if that time when I was calculating how much energy from the coal come to my plug, then is at 24% only. And thus the gas, it's definitely more CO2 efficient option. Yeah? I see I puzzle people with a figure 24%. Well, if you have a coal, you burn it in the coal power plant with the an efficiency of roughly 35%. Then you have a losses on the way. You arrive to your plug with a rough calculation in the Czech, uh, Czech circumstances of 24% efficiency from the original content of the energy in the coal. Yeah. So that's, uh, th there was the figure. So in that time, the reducing the emissions mean don't be on electricity. Gas was CO2 less intensive than the electricity which we have in that time. And obviously I was interested of using the local resources. So we went for the for the wood. Yeah. So we have a, a wood stove which is dis distributed the hot the, the the heating is distributed through the hot air uh, pumping system throughout the house and the gas is only supplementary. My estimation is that we're using the gas maybe for the 25, 30 days a year. Uh, that's the days when it's cold and I am traveling because there is a, no one else in the house who would wake up in the morning and start a fire. Yeah. Uh, so it's the, for, for those circumstances we have the gas. And so the, I don't have a, a certificate on the, on the house, but the real data, uh, it's the 41 kilowatt hours per square meters and year, which is in the definition of the low consumption house. But I guess on the paper data, the figures will be slightly lower because uh, they do not calculate the, the, the real, real consumption. Uh, but also I have to admit my figures are sort of skewed because I do not measure precisely how many wood I, I burn this uh, each of the year. I have a rough estimation, but I am not able to measure it. Or oh, I would be able, but that would be a real challenge. Okay, hot water, we are using a solar, uh, solar system. Uh, we have a boiler for the, for the 30, 30 liters and clearly there is no additional heating uh, so the solar is sufficient between the April and October, uh, uh, April 15 and October 15. Yeah. So now we are in the situation I won't like to get out of the gas. Uh, A because of climate, climate issue, B uh, because the dependency on, on Russia. So I was trying to look what are the different, different options. Uh, one would be the pellets. Uh, uh, it's relatively easy to connect it with the existing system in the house, but it would require a new chimney. We have a limited storage place and pellets are definitely not completely automatic. Uh, I'm highlighting the completely automatic. I'm 53 years old now. And if I would be today, then I will be in 30 years, well, 25 years, 78. If I would have to carry my three cubic meters of the wood, that would be a challenge. Yeah? So I think is that part of the issue is also how the people can use it. So I think is the pellets are possible to use, but it have a, a limits. Another option would be recuperation and the hot water used uh, and the electricity would be, would be done by, uh, for the heating of the hot water. The problem with the recuperation is that this is the house from the 30s. Uh, there are no sort of the system which could be used for the building a uh, air ventilations 
So that would basically mean another massive reconstruction of the house. It's possible, but it's also it will be quite expensive and it, it's relatively large technology. So find the space in the house to placing this technology that will be a major challenge. The electric, direct electric heating that would be using uh, uh, instead of the gas boiler for the electric oil, it's clearly the cheapest option. It's very easy to connect, but it's also the lowest efficiency. You just burn the, the, the electricity into the heating, very low efficiency. Another option would be the heat pumps. Uh, if the heat pumps would be used for the, it will be air to water heat pump. Uh, and that it would use the 60 centigrade water, basically to the current system of the, of the radiators. In that situation, there will be very limited construction needed. It will be very easy to connect to the existing system. Uh, it, will be, it will have a moderate efficiency because heating things up to the 60 centigrade is not, not very, uh, very efficient. The most probably efficient system would be the heat pumps of the 30, 35 centigrade. Uh, and, but that would require the major reconstruction because that would require that all of the floors are heated, not through the radiators, because in the floors you can use lower temperature water for the, for the heating. So, because Gennady asked, you know, make the cost benefit analysis. So, as I said, electric heating would be something like a 400 euros. Yeah, very easy, simple solution, lowest, lowest efficiency. Uh, the, 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 the most complicated, well, I don't know where the most complicated, but the, the definitely most expensive would be recuperation. And it's also have a major impact for the, for the house. Uh, so the, the most efficient would be the heat pumps, uh, but that would cost roughly 10,000 10, euros, which is the, the difficulty uh, because I need to persuade my wife to going for, for the 10,000 euros investment, which have actually a horrible payback period. Because in this moment, we're using the gas boiler only for the, let's say, 30 days for the, for the heating. And for that, we would make a, for the replacing of that, we would make the investment of 10,000 euros, which doesn't make any economic sense. So here comes the motivation. When I was thinking about that, actually, it strike, my, uh, strike me that I need to go back to the motivation with a new kitchen. Because if we do that, I can persuade my wife that we can replace the floors that she is complaining. They are already 80 years old, not well looking. Yeah. And so maybe the main motivation how we can get the investment of the 10,000 of, of our pockets, it's actually for the replacement of the, uh, of, the, of the floors and connecting the heating system to those. That's all. Thank you. That was quite refreshing. And for your sake, I hope your wife is not watching the direct stream uh, because she'll know all your mean plans by now. Um, I think we need a coffee break, Asya, although the plan was different. Um, the idea was that we'll have a flexible break and uh, allow a few questions, but this will remain for the session that will be right before the lunch. Um, I would say we would need about 10 minutes technical time to figure out the new presentations and all of you not overcrowding too much. You can have coffee. Enjoy. It's